Hi, welcome back. We've reached uh, number nine in our series of short films entitled The Master Trainer. If you've been with us from the beginning, can I commend your perseverance and your stamina? Uh, if you haven't been with us from the beginning, then go back and pick out something that appeals to you and have a little look at it. The comments that you've made have been very encouraging that uh, you found the content very helpful and certainly stimulated a lot of thought. So, um, so that's good. As I say, we've moved on to film number nine. And uh, we're now at the stage of that systematic process that we've talked about, where we need to make sure that what we're doing is right. If you remember the evaluation uh, part of the process, we said we were trying to answer two questions. One, was it right? And secondly, was it worth it? And so that's where we're at now. So let me say this. Training is probably the best investment that your organization can ever make. It can drive productivity, it can improve performance, but the problem is how do you tell the difference between what's effective and what's been a total waste of time? Well, the way you do that is by using what we would describe as an evaluation model. Now, the master trainer understands that there are many ways of evaluating and that each organization has its own particular uh, peculiarity, its own particular way of doing things. And one way of evaluating training in a particular organization might not be the same way that is appropriate to another organization. So a master trainer understands this and understands the variety of models that are available and chooses the most appropriate. So I guess the first question to ask is, what, what do we mean by an evaluation model? So let me give you a very simple definition that we work to, and it's this, that evaluation model is a systematic framework that investigates and analyzes the effectiveness of learning programs or journeys. Okay, it's a very simple definition, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to see how effective the training was and also to justify that in some way. The next thing to say is that different models target different aspects of that learning journey. But if we, if we compile all the aspects together, I think we're probably looking at maybe seven particular questions that evaluation is trying to answer. Question number one, was the training successful? Number two, what did the participants learn? Three, did the participants use what they learned on the job? The next one, what was the impact on the organization? Next, was the training a good investment? Next, did the training offer value for money? And lastly, could the training be improved? Now, each training evaluation model takes a slightly different view and looks at a slightly different aspect. And each model will look at some or all of those questions. And the master trainer starts off by asking, what are the questions I need to ask? And once they've decided on the questions they need to ask, then they can settle on the model that they want to use. So let's take a look at some of these models, shall we? Let's start off with what is by far and away the most popular model and the most widely used model. And of course, this has become known as the Kirkpatrick model of evaluation. Needless to say, it was uh, thought of and put into practice by a gentleman called Donald Kirkpatrick. And in 1959, he uh, did a series of articles in an American uh, journal in which he put forward uh, this idea of a systematic approach to evaluating learning. So let's, uh, let's just have a little look at it, shall we? And then we can uh, talk about it in some way. The, uh, the Kirkpatrick model is, as you uh, can see there, and although he, he put the ideas forward in 1959, then it was really as, uh, as late as 1993 that he produced the model as we know it today. He took all of that time to refine it and, and winnow it down. And that's how we end up with four levels. And the book that he published in 1993 was called Evaluating Training Programs, The Four Levels. Really, before we get into it, this is the first time that uh, an evaluation model had been made available in a, an easy to use reference guide. And I guess that's why uh, it has gained the popularity that it has done. It's very straightforward. Kirkpatrick wanted to know what was going on in the learning journey at four separate stages. 
stage number one, he wanted to know how did the learners feel at the point of learning. Then the stage that he went to from there was actually at some point later, can we find out if these learners have actually learned anything? Did anything happen to them to know, do, or understand something that they couldn't do before? The third stage was that has this learning made any difference? Is there a change in the behavior? And the fourth level, of course, is that change in behavior. Has it produced any results? And because it's so easy to understand, then that's why the Kirkpatrick model is the most common evaluation model. And as we'll see, it's provided the base for many, many other training models. Now, most uh, trainers would rely on that model because it is useful to evaluate um, any training course in any situation. However, it takes a very general view of what's happened in the learning journey. Other models that, that are built on, on Kirkpatrick, and some have, have disregarded Kirkpatrick entirely, approach things slightly differently. So for example, in 1970, we have another model that was put forward, and that model is called the, uh, the CSIRO model, or depending upon if you want to keep a, a soft C or a hard C, it's either Cairo or CSIRO. So let's have a little look at that now. As I say, this model here um, was totally unlike Kirkpatrick. It was put forward in a book called Evaluation of Management Training by uh, three gentlemen, Peter War, Michael Bird, and Neil Rackman in 1970. And as I say, unlike Kirkpatrick's model, the CSIRO model specifically is aimed at evaluating management training. CSIRO, of course, as you can see there, is an acronym, acronym, I should say, and it stands for the four levels which make up this approach. The CSIRO model is hierarchical. That's the first thing to understand. So that means that you must start by studying the C, and as you can see, um, the C stands for context. So what is the context of the learning event? The I is input. What are the inputs that go into the learning event? The R is the reactions to the learning event, and O, of course, is the outcome of the learning event. Now, I should say this, that um, we're not going to go into these models in any great depth. We haven't got time to do that. But I want to point you to our very substantial reference uh, document, which is right below me here. It's a substantial support document. If you download that, then we go into these models in more detail and we talk about ways to implement them and, and things like that. So, so download that and then you'll pick up in the gaps that I'm, that I'm leaving. The next model I want to look at is a model that was put forward by a gentleman called Jack Phillips. And uh, Jack Phillips is known to many people because um, we've taken part of what Phillips was talking about and tacked it onto the top of Kirkpatrick's model and made a fifth level. Um, however, Jack Phillips produced an evaluation model in its own right. So let's have a little look at that now, can we? I suppose to talk about this and to ease our way into it, we should say that as Kirkpatrick grew in popularity through the 1970s, um, then many academics and business practitioners wanted to build and expand on it. And Jack Phillips was one of those people. So in 1980, he produced his own book, which he called Return on Investment in Training and Performance. And as you can see, there are many similarities between uh, what he put forward in his model and what we've already seen with Kirkpatrick. The main differences, as you'll notice there, are the two top layers of that pyramid. Jack Phillips wanted to look at the, the impact of training. In other words, in a much broader context, um, he wanted to help identify the factors other than training that were responsible for delivering the outcomes. So he, he, he focused in on the impact. But really, um, the most famous bit of his model, as I say, is the top bit there, which he called ROI. Now, unlike Kirkpatrick's model that uh, concentrated on uh, the results from a stakeholder point of view, did I learn anything, what behavior has changed, 
how do the results differ now, that is often called ROE, return on expectation. Um, Jack Phillips brought the financial aspect into it. And he brought into that top part of the pyramid that we call return on investment. In other words, the amount of money that you're spending to conduct this training, are you getting anything back in a tangible way? Is there some financial benefit that you can see from the training? And uh, Phillips, in order to show that, used some uh, financial models, particularly to do with cost-benefit analysis and, and, and things like that. Now, I'm sure there are many uh, other places you can go to to find out about that. But again, forgive the advert for a minute. If you go to the Institute's website, navigate through professional development, through to home study certificates, you'll see there a complete home study certificate on evaluation of training. And uh, there's a major section in there that's devoted to these financial instruments. So Jack Phillips, in his own right, produced a very valuable model for evaluation. There is another model uh, for evaluation, which is called the success case method. And I just want to talk a little bit about that now. Okay, the success case method. So it was in 2003 when a gentleman by the name of Robert Brinkerhoff put forward a totally different approach to evaluating training. Um, and that's how we end up with the name success case method, because his approach to evaluation doesn't just apply to training. It applies to many other uh, situations, and it can be applied to practically anything, really. But when it's applied to training, um, it's worth saying that it's totally different to anything we've looked at so far, because up to now, we're looking at um, a sort of a general approach, a, a, a sort of an average uh, data system. Brinkerhoff takes the exact opposite view. He wants to look at specific cases. He's not concerned with uh, the general. And he decides to go to the two extremes. So he um, looks at when training worked well and when training went wrong, either horribly or just a little bit wrong. And so really what we're doing here is we're, we're looking and wanting to answer two, two questions. And the first question is, when the training went well, why was that? What were the factors that made it a success? And then also to look at training when it went wrong and say, when it did go wrong, can we identify specific reasons for that? Building on a five-step approach around those questions, he builds up a picture of a success case and that success case, once it's identified, can be replicated. So we've looked at three alternative models there. Now I've encouraged you to download the support document underneath here, and in there you'll find those three models talked about, but also two extra models. A model that is put forward by a gentleman called Kaufman, and another model that's been put forward by a gentleman called Anderson. And those two models are talked about in there as well. So what are we trying to say out of all of this? Well, in a very roundabout way, and maybe you may consider it a, a dry way, what we're trying to say is that the master trainer knows that they have options. They're not locked in to a particular way of doing things. They, as always, understand the situation, understand the learner, understand the organization, understand the performance issue that needs dealing with. And in the light of all that, they choose the most appropriate way of evaluating whether the training has worked. Was it right? And was it worth it? It's not easy, but to be a master trainer is hard work. And this is one of those aspects of being a master trainer that is maybe a little bit more hard work than the others. But this aspect of it will give you the reputation of becoming a real professional, somebody who not only knows what they're doing, but somebody that makes a real difference in the organizations they work with. So that's where we're leaving this, this one. Uh, thank you for being with me. And until next time, goodbye. Hi, thanks for watching the film. I want to keep you just for 30 seconds more because 
I wondered that maybe you were in a position where you are an experienced trainer, a consultant or facilitator, but you don't have that paper credibility that testifies to that fact. ITOL have a full range of qualifications. If you click on the link below, you can see all of them there, and we'd love to be your partner in your personal development in the future. Thanks very much.